the actual Warburg and meta metabolic theory actually means. So this is a, a diagram uh, of a, a cell. You can see the, the, the mitochondria is here. Uh, about um, 89 to 90% of the energy that we get in our bodies comes from respiration. We breathe in air, we give off CO2, we produce water. We're all alive, we're all breathing, unless there's anybody a zombie out there. I don't think so. But we get our energy from respiration. Now, we have very small amounts of energy coming from uh, a fermentation pathway, the glycolytic pathway in the cytoplasm, and also uh, in a, in a, in a succinyl-CoA synthetase step inside the Krebs cycle. What happens in cancer is there's a shift. You're getting less energy from oxphos and more energy from these primitives. See, they make very small amounts of energy in normal cells, but what the cancer cell does is it seems to upregulate energy from these two sources, which are ancient forms of, of uh, compensatory energy. This is the way most organisms on the planet would get energy before oxygen came into the environment. So, the question then becomes, in, in light of that knowledge, how do we get cancer? Where does cancer come from? So we know, and nobody denies this, carcinogens cause cancer. You're exposed to some chemical carcinogen. Oh, he got cancer, he was exposed to asbestos or some other chemical. We know that radiation causes cancer, right? Radiation, people say, oh, you get cancer from radiation. Uh, intermittent hypoxia, the stopping of oxygen, can cause cancer. Systemic inflammation can cause cancer, all right? That, these are known carcinogens, known process. Rare inherited mutations. Okay, you can know that BRCA1, you know, you hear about these genes, they only cause cancer if they affect the mitochondria, and I'll present that in just a sec. And we know RAS and, and viruses, hepatitis, hepatoma, hepatitis C virus, papilloma viruses, HIV viruses, they all will cause cancer in one form or another. So what happens is that you have this um, oncogenic paradox, which means that, which was a mystery for so many years, and even in, in Sid Mukherjee's book, Emperor of All Maladies, on page 303, he addresses how is it possible that all these different cancer causing can produce the disease through a common pathophysiological mechanism. That's the oncogenic paradox, which has plagued the field for decades. So what, what happens then is that when you, any one of these provocative, you can get breast cancer from several of these, you can get a her, inherited mutation, you get carcinogens, you get x-ray, whatever it is. It damages the respiration. The, the, the mitochondria throw out reactive oxygen species. These are radicals. They damage proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So the mutations in the nucleus are essentially coming as a downstream epiphenomenon of the damage to the respiration. The ROS are par carcinogenic and mutagenic, and it's coming from the damage. And not only that, it further damages respiration. And on the bottom here, you'll see we get most of our ATP. It starts to dissipate. It becomes down, and it has to be chronic. It can't be acute. The cell will die. And then the red line is the compensation from substrate-level phosphorylation, which is a fermentation metabolism. So as this tumor progresses, we collect mutations in the nucleus, we start to dissipate our energy from respiration, and we accumulate energy from fermentation, and everything goes to crap, okay? The cells start growing, all these problems happen. The nuclear mutations that the people are studying are irrelevant. We know that because if we take the nucleus and put it in a new cytoplasm with new mitochondria, that stuff goes away. Okay, now here are the hallmarks of cancer, as Hanahan and Weinberg have pointed out. Hallmarks. Now, once the cell loses its capability of control, it enters the default state. This is the state that the cell had, had when it was before oxygen came on the planet some two and a half billion years ago. All the cells were fermenting. They grew un, with unbridled proliferation, and they stopped growing when they ran out of fermentable fuels. They would die. But these self uh, uh, sufficiency and growth and sensitivity, all that limited, that's all the capability, that's all happening because the cells are renting their default state. They also blow out uh, um, uh, acidic um, materials into the microenvironment, which then uh, causes uh, 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 acidification and inflammation, and this leads to further tumor growth, angiogenesis, blood vessels. The, don't forget, when something like this happens, our cells have an internal system, a kill switch, which is the mitochondria, supposed to kill a cell that has these problems. The kill switch is broken in the cancer cell. It's not working. Therefore, the cell evades this apoptotic signaling, program cell death, and goes on. And if this continues, we get metastatic cancer. But the metastatic cancer comes through a different kind of a mechanism. And I'll show you that here. So, um, okay, where does metastatic cells come? Everything that now that I've talked about you can find in a benign tumor. It's when the tumor breaks away and gets into the circulatory system and creates met metastases, and they become very difficult to control. So we have here normal epithelial cells, 
Now, these cells can get damaged from any one of the uh, oncogenic paradox issues. They start to proliferate. They start to in increase in the microenvironment. Cells of our immune system now come in because they see this as a wound. They have wound healing capabilities. The macrophages throw out growth factors and cytokines to put the wound out, but in so doing, it makes these blue cells grow even faster. So we, our, our own bodies have a counteractive. We're, we're, we're fighting against each other. They're doing, they're doing an inappropriate thing, but they're programmed to do that. These cells will actually fuse with some of the cells to help put out the fire, right, these macrophages. And in so doing, they dilute their normal mitochondria in the cytoplasm. Now, these macrophages now become corrupted. These are the most powerful cells in our body. They evolve to kill bacteria and keep us healthy from the environment. This is like the police department and the militia being corrupted in your own, in your own uh, society. Bad problem rogue macrophages. They're programmed to enter and exit the circulatory system. They're programmed to shut down immune responses. These are a tough cell to kill. They live in hypoxic environments, making them very difficult to kill. And they love glutamine. They love glutamine. So you have to know that. So if most cancer cells obtain energy through fermentation, what can we do? Uh, one strategy is try to reduce fermentable fuels and give them non-fermentable fuels. So what we do is we use calorie-restricted ketogenic diets, therapeutic fasting, and this kind of thing that we've heard about today. So here's a number of things about calorie restriction. The, the important thing here is that calorie restriction and restricted ketogenic, reduce blood glucose levels, the fermentable fuel, and elevate ketone bodies, a non-fermentable fuel. So what we're trying to do is just simply take away the driving fuel that makes the beast go and giving it something that it can't use. Uh, they, and also, this enhances the mitochondria in normal mitochondria. It starts to make them healthier. But when I use, I'm going to show you calorie restriction in the mouse. But CR in the mouse equates water-only therapeutic fasting. And we heard that from Dr. Group this morning, which was very, was very interesting. So when I talk about calorie restriction in mice, if you want to get the same effect, you have to stop eating and just drink water. All right? Now, we use ketogenic diets. Oh, this is a big mystery. Oh, hey, this diet, that diet, you know, you have Atkins diet, this diet. You know, the, the thing of it is, it's, it's very low carbohydrate. Let me go back. It's a very low carb diet, but it, the carbs, the proteins, and the fats all play a very important role in ketogenic. That's not all the same. Many different forms of ketogenic diets. Important, for, important thing, don't eat too much of this. If you eat too much, you get insensitivity and make the damn tumor grow faster. You have to, food is medicine. If you don't know how to use the medicine, you can harm yourself. You need people that know how to do this stuff. Okay, so the, 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 the goal here is that if you want to manage, or at least the first step in trying to manage the disease is we've got to lower the blood sugar and we've got to elevate the non-fermentable ketones and then we can slow this guy down. I'm not saying we cure him or we resolve. I just say we slow it down because if we can slow it down, we can make him vulnerable to other forms of attack and I'll show you about that. So this was one of the first reports that got our attention by Linda Nemley at Case Western Reserve. She took two little girls, hopeless cases, brutalized, brutalized by the system. Surgery, radiation, chemo, the poor little kids lost their... So she put them on this ketogenic diet and was able to keep one kid alive for two more years. They were, they were supposed to be dead very quickly. Read the original paper. And one, one other kid was lost to follow-up. This is the only study done in pediatric oncology that I know about where they actually got tremendous results. They don't do it. That we do it in epilepsy all the time, uh, treating kid, little kids with, with ketogenic diets, but not in pediatric oncology. It's a tragedy in my, in, my, in my point. Now, because of Linda's paper, we got very excited. So we decided to say, oh, you know, can we, how, do, how are we going to be able to do this? So we just take these mice, put uh, a glioblastoma or, or astrocytoma cells into their brain, and then we wait a couple of days, and then we gave them calorie restriction. And I said, 40% calorie restriction is like water-only therapeutic fasting. And you can see this large tumor on the guy. This is standard diet, high, unrestricted, which is a high-carbohydrate diet, high carbs. And this is the uh, same diet, just restricted 40, the 40%, and we get anywhere 65 to 85% reduction in the size of the tumor. And what's going, each, each square here is a mouse under a different dietary condition. So as glucose goes down, ketones go up. This is an evolutionarily conserved ad adaptation to what happens when we stop eating. Ketones go up because the brain has to have an energy taking away the glucose. As glucose goes down, the size of the tumor goes down. This was our work in the mouse. It has since been replicated in human glioblastoma, bre a human breast cancer, colon cancer, all these different cancers. The higher your sugar, the faster the tumor grows. The lower the sugar, the slower the tumor grows. Why is that so hard for anyone to understand? Why in oncology clinics you give cake and ice cream to the kids? It's, it's clear, and it's been replicated over and over again. 
Okay, we characterize the molecular. How does it work? What's the molecular, what's the molecular mechanism? What's the molecular mechanism? Anti-angiogenic. We did tons of studies. It shuts down blood vessels. Anti-inflammatory. Shuts down NF-kappa B signaling. And it's pro-apatotic. It, it, it kills the cells through an apatotic mechanism. So we, we did all those molecular mechanisms. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about glioblastoma multiforme. It's a terrible disease. You hear uh, Senator McCain, unfortunately, is, is trying to battle this disease. And we heard the beautiful lecture from Dr. Brzezinski and his exceptional work in trying to save some of these people. This is a very difficult disease to manage. Poor prognosis, no effective therapies. And it's multiforme because it has many different kinds of cells, stem cells, different, these mesenchymal cells that are heavily invaded. And secondary structures are shear. It's just the way these tumor cells invade through the brain. And if these cells ever get outside of the brain, it doesn't happen often, but they can be highly metastatic. So this is what a GBM uh, uh, looks like. You know, here you have on the, uh, on the left is a, is a cross-section through someone's brain who passed away. You can see this large necrotic area. Many of these people die from, from brain swelling. You can see the compression of the, of, the, of the cerebral ventricle here. And now this is a histological section of an area out in the area, away from the tumor. And you, uh, you see the tumor proper. These are blood vessels, and the dark cells around the blood vessels here are tumor cells. The tumor cells are using these blood vessels as kind of a highway system to get and invade through the brain. So immunotherapies work on the inside. They're not going to get the tumor cells on the outside. So these tumor cells, oh, that's why the surgeon can't cure this, because these tumor cells have already spread through the brain. Very difficult disease to manage. And we know from our, my collaborators, Arismendi, Murillo, Gabriel, and down at Venezuela, who do beautiful electron micro, micrograph work. Here's a normal mitochondria, and those stripes, are the, those stripes contain the lipids and proteins that allow us to get energy from oxid, oxidative phosphorylation. This is a mitochondrion from a glioblastoma. It's empty. No, the, the, the has, it can't respire because the very structures needed are absent. So for that cell to grow, it must ferment. So this is crystallosis. We have never found a tumor with normal contents and composition of cardiolipin, the major lipper in the stripe. This is why I think all these tumors are fermenting to one degree or another. Now, what happens is, of course, in the glioblastoma and brain tumors in general, we have a uh, glucose comes in, pours into these cells, environment and can go back into the bloodstream and return as sugar through the Cori cycle and other. But what we do is lower the blood sugar, and then we bring the ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate, into this. The problem is the tumor cell can't use these ketone bodies because you need a good mitochondria to do that. So we metabolically marginalize these brain tumor cells while the normal cells are using these ketone bodies effectively. So we just take, we, we give the normal cells what they can use, and then the tumor cells can't use that, and we pull down the glucose with this, which the tumor cells really need. Now, there's two things we've learned over the years, and this is established in the, in the, in the entire cancer uh, 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 field, the metabolic field, is that there are two fuels that are driving the beast. And this is not only for glioblastoma, this is for all cancers, glucose and glutamine. So these two fuels are coming into these tumor cells because they can't get energy effectively from the TCA cycle. So they can get energy through substrate-level phosphorylation in the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway, and they get glutamine coming in that makes glutamate that can give them further substrate energy. And they produce a shield against radiation and chemo because their antioxidants inside the cell are driven by glucose and glutamine. Okay? And, the, and these two fuels are giving them enough to build DNA, RNA, new protein, new lipid. And they take lipids from the microenvironment. But they need the glucose and glutamine for the energy to grow. We know this. So in order to trap these cells and kill them, you have to shut down their ability to get these fermentable fuels. That's the key. Okay? Now, this is an example of what we do in the clinic for people with brain cancer. I published this in 2010. What we do is we surgically debulk immediately for somebody who has a GBM. We don't do very rarely watchful waiting. And then we irradiate. And this irradiation breaks and causes necrotic dead cells and it breaks the cycle of glutamate glutamine, which is very tightly controlled in our brains. And it frees up a lot of glutamine, which the tumor cells that are never all completely resected start to suck down this glutamine. When you irradiate somebody and you get a lot of edema in the brain, the brain starts to swell. So what you do is you give high-dose dexamethasone to the cancer patients. The high dose dexamethasone causes hyperglycemia. The two fuels that I just said are driving the beast are created by the very standard of care used to treat these people. Okay? We create the perfect storm for the demise of these brain cancer patients. And here's the evidence to prove what I just said. This is from Stupp. He's a very famous brain cancer person. 
He does uh, clinical trials. Radiation. How many survivors did we have of these 278 that get radiation? Zero. Okay, and then we developed temozolomide, a toxic alkylating agent. And we got a little bit of progression-free survival and a tiny bit more overall survival, but still abysmal, right? Okay, what does temozolomide do? It, uh, uh, it gives you diarrhea, uh, nausea, vomiting, and fatigue. All indirect forms of calorie restriction. I published it. Whoa, 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 you can't, can't say that. Okay, so the, the bottom line here is we have a problem. The problem is the standard of care. Now, I want to just, this is Brittany Maynard. You may have remember her for a few years ago. She made tremendous uh, news about her decision to die with dignity. She had a, a glioblastoma. This is a tragic, tragic situation. The poor girl, here she is here right after she got married. She went in, she had a, a low-grade tumor. They pull out, oh, you got a low-grade tumor, not to worry. Two months later, glioblastoma, okay? So she goes on the standard of care. And, of course, radiation and surgery and high-dose chemo. Look at her. Does she look the same here as she does here? This is from high-dose steroids. You get moon face. All right? High-dose steroids raising blood sugar. She knows. She goes on People magazine and discusses her decision to die with dignity. Right? The day of which she, she died. She didn't want to put up with this. To be with her family and she dies with dignity. This, this, this discussion in People magazine was all about the morality of death with dignity. There was nothing discussing the abysmal failure of the standard of care, because if it wasn't that, she wouldn't have to go through this. Now, this is Pablo Kelly. He was diagnosed with the same tumor in, in August 2014. Okay. Oh, Pablo, you have a GBM. In fact, it's inoperable, but you have to do chemo and radiation right away. Pablo says no. He, Pablo says, so he emails me. He said, what can I do? I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll give you a couple of uh, ideas. So he may, you go and look at, there's a lot of discussion in England about this right now. He's an Englishman. So Pablo rejects the standard of care. He rejects, sir, he rejects, he couldn't be surgically debolt, but he, but he could have been irradiated and poisoned. And he said, I don't want that. So the, uh, two and a half years later, in fact, it was just this winter, Pablo's tumor now becomes operable. So Pablo has his tumor taken out. He's doing fine, right? He's now 36 months out. I know from what Dr. Brzezinski said, you know, you've got to live a lot longer than that. But he, we call him a long-term survivor. He's three years out, and he's doing fine. He's a high quality of life. He's thinking about getting married. I don't know how long Pablo's going to live, but the English newspapers now are coming all over this. He's a pioneer, a renegade. Andrew Scarborough in England, um, uh, we, we have Gannett, Alison Gannett. There's a lot of people that are looking at what Pablo did and saying, I want to do what Pablo did. Now, what I did to help the cancer patients, all cancer patients, we, my students and I, how do we know we're in therapeutic ketosis? So if we're going to use therapeutic ketosis as a, as a way to, to manage the cancer, we have to know when we're in therapeutic ketosis. So we built the glucose ketone index calculator, and it's, it's when you get the ratio of 1.0 or below, it helps the patient know, can I eat this, can I eat that, I know what should I eat, what is your index? Oh, I, I guess I can't eat that, or yes, oh, I can eat that. So uh, Heads Up Health put up an app, which was made actually for cancer patients, but now all these healthy guys, that all, they all want to see what their index is just to get healthy. They don't have any cancer, you see how low they can get their index. But, so what we developed based on all of our experiences, and we just published this paper in Nutrition and Metabolism with my colleagues, uh, Drs. Maroon and you and Don Diagostino, it's called the Press Pulse. We took this concept of Press Pulse from the field of paleobiology, because in the past we had these mass extinctions, but the extinction occurred only when you had a chronic stress on a population coupled at the same time with an acute stress, and it caused extermination of the population. So we just adapted that for how we're going to exterminate cancer cells in the body, and we used the Vitruvian man symbol. So the patients come in, they get metastatic cancer, stage 4 cancer, whatever. Then we begin this press pulse therapeutic strategy, and we try to manage, get the stage to management, and we try to get resolution, and we try to do it without any toxicity to the patient. We want these people to emerge from this therapy healthier than when they started, not looking like death warmed over. Okay, so we use ketogenic diets. Yes, water-only therapeutic fasting, powerful. Ketone supplementations, bring the sugars down, throw the ketones on them. Stress management, so important, stress management. So important, all right? And we heard about this today. Some of these cancer patients, you get that diagnosis, you got anxiety. 
What does anxiety do? It raises cortisol, raises blood sugar, it makes the damn tumor grow faster. It makes the press pulse procedure work so much better. So yes, stress management, exercise. So we, these are considered the press. Then we use pulses. And these are drugs that will target further the availability of glucose and glutamine. And we use hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which creates oxidative stress, just like radiation does, but doesn't harm the body. We can blow those tumor cells up with oxidative stress without radiation. So the key is doses, timing, and scheduling. And that's where our research is right now. We have not yet found the perfect dose, timing, and scheduling to make this an optimal therapy. And that's where we're, and you know how hard it is to get money to do this? This is not considered sexy science. This is the kind of science that works, but it's not sexy. Once we, once we have this down, we're gonna, this cancer is gonna be history. We're gonna drop the damn death rate on this thing by 50%. Okay, I'm just going to run through a quick couple of slides to show you the strategies that we're using with our metabolic models. We developed the best glioblastoma models and models for metastatic cancer in the lab over a 20-year period characterizing this. So the VM model of human GBM is exceptionally good, and it grows the same way a human GBM. Look at them growing around the blood vessel. These are dark tumor cells around the blood vessel, just like you saw in the human GBM. They, they do the same thing. People say you cure the mouse all the time. No, you don't cure the mouse all the time. If you have a tumor that the if you have a, a mouse a tumor in the mouse that's exactly like the tumor, and you you don't have you you stand it. Uh, it's hard. It's very hard. They use these abnormal models that make it look like they're doing good. You got to use a real one like we use. Okay, now here's, let me just show you how tough. Okay, so we put the tumor cells into the brain. You see this here? These are the tumor. They rip right through that. They go through the one side of the brain to the other. So we said, okay, we're going to use ketogenic diets, calorie, water-only fasting. You're going to target the glucose. And we did. Look at this. We stopped the invasion, and we slowed the tumor ground, but the damn tumor cells are still alive. We threw everything at this tumor, and yet it still killed the mouse. So what's going on? Ketogenic diet, what's going on? What's going on? I said, what's the other fuel these guys are using? Glutam glutamine. I said, it's glucose and glutamine. Th this doesn't target the glutamine. So we said, oh, to test the hypothesis, we use this drug, 6-diazo-5, oxoneural. It's an old drug from the cancer field. They stopped using it years ago. And uh, here's the structure. And it stops TCA cycle substrate level phosphorylation, stops DNA and RNA synthesis. I said, well, why don't we put them on a ketogenic diet and then give them the glutamine inhibitor and see what happens? So here's our strategy. We implant the tumors into the brain. These are bioluminescent. We have them genetically engineered so we can see them. Three days later, let the tumor get big and aggressive. Then we pulse, bang. We put them on a short fast, give them standard diet, high-carb diet, or the ketogenic diet restricted. And then we pulse, bang, 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 bang. Hit them with the Don, the glutamine inhibitor. We have to stop the study at 15 days because the mice eating the high-carb diets are dropping. They're starting to get really sick, so we have to stop the experiment at that time. And then when you take the brain out of the mouse and you put it in the dish and you do bioluminescent imaging, tremendous light. That means there's a lot of live tumor cells in that mouse's brain. With Dawn, the glutamine inhibitor, this is background. None of this is light. This is just background. This one guy that we decided not to inject, he looked a little funny, finicky. I said, let's take him off a couple of doses. He's the only guy that had a few tumor cells left in his brain. And then what we found is the ketogenic diet facilitates the delivery of Don to the brain. This is unbelievable. It delivers it right through the blood-brain barrier. You don't even need to use as much Don to get the, the, the power. You get a lot of bang for your buck when you put the drug with the ketogenic diet. We use select um, a, a, a liquid chromatography mass spec analysis to measure the amount of drug in the brains of these animals. So we said, what's going on in the brain histologically? What does it look like? So here's the data from that. So here's your standard high carb diet. You can see this dark, this is the dark tumor. And look at, this is the white area, invading massively into the white clear, into the uh, non area, the, 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 the other part of the clean brain. It's almost completely, and look at how densely packed and wonderfully happy these guys are in their, in their glucose and glutamine environment. Then we use the ketogenic diet. Now the ketogenic diet, it stops the invasion, but it doesn't kill, and there's more spacing between the cells, less dense tumor cells. But then we use the diet and the dawn, and this is a battlefield. We slaughtered these tumor cells, slaughtered them. This is consistent with the fact there's no light in this brain. We absolutely decimated these tumor cells. It's the, you're taking away the glutamine, 
and the glucose, the two fermentable fuels that are driving the beast. And then we took the cells and we grew them outside the brain, and we know they're highly metastatic. This was done by my colleague, Dom Diagostino and Angela Poff at the University of South Florida. So these are our system, but you, you can see the cells spreading all through the brain, uh, all through the mouse. They go to the liver and everything else. Then he used hyperbaric oxygen by itself, not much effect. Ketogenic diet by itself, eh, a little bit better. Put the hyperbaric, now hyperbaric oxygen will kill the tumor cells by an oxidative stress mechanism, but you gotta remove the fermentable fuel first. And that's what this does. We remove the fermentable fuel and we were able to kill far more cells. Now this is our, this is our uh, most recent publication that just was published. Now, I was surprised that people who read my book uh, take it and do all the stuff that I'm learning today that, you know, I, I didn't know this. I don't, I don't have, I'm in a biology department at Boston College. I don't see patients. I work with physicians in different places, and they tell me, you know, does it work or not. But I don't know individual people who get healthy from this stuff. So, so anyway, a young group of, of clinicians at uh, Istanbul Cancer Center, a very distinguished cancer center in Turkey, were able to take and uh, 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 apply some of our concepts to their stage four cancer patients. And this is triple negative breast cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, stage four pancreatic cancer. Can you believe this? So they use this term called metabolically supported chemo, which is essentially using the very lowest doses of chemo together with ketogenic diets, hyperthermia, which is another stress thing. I didn't get a chance to talk about that. Hyperbaric oxygen and some glucose inhibitors and things like this. So this woman comes in with triple negative breasts. You know, triple negative breasts and metastasize to the liver and the abdomen, the abdomen, not good, not, not, a, not, a, not a good situation. So we put her on this, on this metabolic therapy and you can see within five months, we couldn't find any can. Now that's not saying she's cured. I agree, it could, be a, uh, it could come back, I don't know. But the issue is we don't see many cases where you get a complete resolution in such a short period of time. Now this is not a fluke because they've done it on several other women with triple negative breast cancer and they got the same results. And if you saw the results from pancreatic cancer and non-small cell lung cancer and ovarian cancer and gastric cancer using the same kind of approach with slightly different chemicals for whatever that particular cancer uses, you can, so we're getting the same kind of results, right? You know why? Because cancer is one disease. It's not a hundred diseases like you're made to think about. It's a single disease of energy metabolism driven by glucose and glutamine. So when you take glucose and glutamine away, you have to get... This woman went through the procedure with no toxicity, no hair loss, no nausea, no vomiting, none of this kind of stuff. All right? And many of these cancer patients are doing the same thing. They're doing really well. More, more than, well, like Dr. Brzezinski said, it doesn't work on everybody, but it works on a significant number to say, what the hell is going on here? So, cancer is a type of mitochondrial metabolic disease. It is not a genetic disease. In the future, we will come to recognize that the view of cancer as a genetic disease is and will be considered the greatest fiasco in the history of medicine, leading to the unnecessary death and suffering of tens of millions of people. A reliance on substrate-level phosphorylation is what these cells are doing. The simultaneous restriction of fermentable fuels will take away the, 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 the drivers of this disease. The press pulse is just beginning as a novel protocol for treating cancer without toxicity. It is a non-toxic, cost-effective, in fact, I have a student that's, we have another form of toxicity I just realized not long ago when I read the Wall Street Journal. If you want to know about cancer, you read the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> read the hard paper edition and the online version so you can see how the stock markets go up and down depending on what that article said for the, for the drug companies. Okay? So this is what I had my students do. And now we know we have financial toxicity, a new form of toxicity for cancer. They can't afford the damn payments of the bill. Why are we doing that? There's a morality issue here. You don't do that to people. So we have, and, and here's, my, here's the thing. 
the reason we're, we, we, have to, we have to conglomerate the tribes, these organizations, the breast cancer organization, the brain cancer organization, the lung cancer, it's all the same disease. The tribes are fragmented. There should be United States of cancer. You can have breast cancer, you can have colon cancer, but you should put them under, it's cancer. We're raising money. We, ra we should be going, marching on war. Where is the outrage about this? Right? Nobody's doing anything. And the people themselves are complicit to some degree. They feel they need to suffer to get healthy. It's part of the mindset. It's not right. It's not right. So I want to thank the collaborators that have worked with me over the years. The United States, people in the United States, Turkey, Germany, Venezuela, Hungary, Greece, France, Egypt, and now we have them from India. And I'd especially like to thank the funding agencies that support what we do. And as I mentioned, it's very hard to get the money to do these kinds of, of experiments. And it mostly comes from Single Cause, Single Cure Foundation, uh, and Joe McCullough has been kind enough to try to help raise money for that foundation to support our research. I'd like to thank Ellen Davis. Uh, George Yu is, is now sponsoring a cancer metabolism meeting in Maryland uh, in November. And this is where we're going to have debates about whether it's a genetic disease or a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And we're also broadening it out to Alzheimer's disease as well. So, because Alzheimer's disease is another metabolic disease. Actually, it's cardiovascular disease is another metabolic disease. You can go right through the list and you can start managing these. But we're after cancer because it's such a devastating disease and it doesn't need to be. And I'd like to thank my research, my institution, Boston College, and from the NIH in the past that gave us money to study angiogenesis because it was one of the hallmarks. But then we realized and we moved further. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seafried. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Thomas Seafried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Seafried.